All right. So the name of today's talk is Face Fear Together. The song was Lean On Me by Bill Withers, Stevie Wonder, and John Legend. So we're going to talk about how to overcome fear, indigenous lessons from the Amazon. We're going to talk about how we can face fear, the future without fear together. We're going to talk about being there for others. We will talk about scriptural references to helping others and being a friend to each other. So this talk is about the power of community, of not going it alone, of being vulnerable and accepting help from others, about a system built on mutual respect, a community where all the people are treated with genuine concern for their well-being. When life and death depends on the help of others, the community builds a shield of protection. It's about visualizing our support system when we are afraid. It is also about changing our mindset from being self-centered to being other-centered, to remembering we are all people with the same needs, desires, hopes, and dreams, and that in order to heal divisiveness, we need to remember that. We, the people, together. Fear comes from being separate and alone. So I'm going to start with some quotes. It's when we start working together that the real healing takes place. That's from David Hume. Healing yourself is connected with healing others. That's from Yoko Ono. Part of the healing process is sharing with other people who care, Jerry Cantrell. Eventually, you'll come to understand that love heals everything and that love is all there is. That's from Gary Zukov. Love one another and help others to rise to the higher levels simply by pouring out love. Love is infectious and the greatest healing energy. That's by Sai Baba. He is an Indian spiritual teacher, considered to be a saint. He is revered by both Hindus and Muslims. So there are two pieces to this talk. The first is about how fear is overcome by living in a community where there are relationships which support each other and help each other through difficulties and remembering our support system when we are afraid. The second is about the larger picture, we, the people, country, tribe, community, world can face the future if we do it together with respect and integrity and love. So we're going to start with how to overcome fear, the indigenous lessons from the Amazon. This is written by an anthropologist and author whose mission is to improve people's lives by removing fear as a barrier. And his name is Eric Severson. So most people spend their entire lives avoiding what they are afraid of. But after years of studying with the indigenous tribes in the Amazon and the borders of Brazil and Suriname and French Guyana, he found that there was a different way. He was doing research for months living with the Wayana tribe. He was surprised by how they handle fear in a way that benefits them instead of holding them back. They live deep in the jungle. It is forbidden for outsiders to go there without permission from the government. He was given permission because he's a researcher. But he says, but he wasn't given a map and told how to get there. He had to find all that out on himself. It took three days in a carved out canoe, three days in that canoe, just to get to the edge of the territory of a community called Mori Posala. The closer he got, the more nervous he became. How was he going to get into the forest? How was he going to paddle up the river alone? So Mori Posala is a territory of France. There are a few French services that were there. There's a small military police, there are teachers, and there are medical personnel. So there is a doctor that goes once a month up to Mori Posala, and he was going the next day. So he was able to go with that doctor part of the way. Uh, the doctor provides medical attention. He went with him. But as he got closer and closer, his excitement turned to fear as he asked himself, where would he sleep? What would he eat? Would the Wayana people even accept him? So the doctor suggested that they stop at a village called Coyote that was 60 people. That for them was a big village. Um, so he walked towards this large communal hut in the center of the village and they entered during the festival of Ta'aki, which is a multi-day festival. Wayana would invite the neighboring villages to share in the consumption of Kashiki. So some were dancing in the circle, others were sitting around the edges, children were running around playing with bows and arrows. The first interaction that he had with the Wayana people was this man running up to him with a gourd full of this whitish, milky liquid. The doctor indicated that he should drink it all. It was pulpy and fermented. 
The moment I accepted the gourd with the Kashiri, I entered a contractual exchange relationship with this man. Kashiri is a mildly alcoholic beverage. Women peel, pound, and cut up a root called matiak. They chew it up and spit it into a large wooden vat where it ferments for a very long time. Once they have a large amount of Kashiri, the village invites other villages to come over and share it. This is the exchange relationship, the social fabric. It helps them to survive. The translator asked the village, uh, the high priest of the village if he could stay and he said yes. And then they was given more Kashira all through the evening and all through the night. The fears of food and shelter were alleviated and he realized that relationships reduce fear. After living with them, he realized that one of the Wayana's largest fear was having no food. As hunters and gatherers, a small scale agriculture that they had, if the person was unsuccessful in hunting one day, he might not eat. However, because of this exchange relationship that is set up, if another had a successful hunt, the food would be shared. For Wayana, the fear of not having food is not an individual burden. It is greatly reduced by the person's exchange relationships within the community. These are the social fabric, the unspoken contracts of exchange. They were relieved of constant anxiety and wondering if they would have their next meal. Relationships reduce fear. What if somebody couldn't reciprocate and be actively in exchange relationship? The chains of these relationships solve things for the very young, for the ill, and for the elderly. So this man, Oniwa, caught this large fish and he served it to the, the fish with uh, cassava cakes. He shared it with him and his wife and his wife's parents and his young child. The next afternoon, Oniwa said he was hungry and asked if he was successful. He, the writer, was successful in hunting. And I said, no, I am not. But I had given shotgun shells to another man. And he said, great, we will all eat today. If the hunter is successful, you'll give him the meat and he will give the meat to Oniwa and Oniwa will share it with his wife, his wife, parents, and his child. He said, we will all eat. Because the supposition is if one person gets in, brings in food, then everybody in the community eats. It was successful that day. He had a large wild boar. Day after day, he said, I watched the self-centered fear change due to the community that empowered everyone. Again, relationships reduced fear. So they have no electricity. So if one person hunted a very large animal, there was no way to store the meat. It would be enough for himself for the whole week, but he couldn't store it. So he would share it all the first day, knowing the meat would be reciprocated on another day. What if we could learn something from the Wayana about community? Less emphasis on ourselves as individuals mitigated our fears by providing support to others as well as accepting help from others. What if someone couldn't reciprocate at all? What was that person gonna be left out? He said, for a short time, I was that person. After traveling further up the river deep into the Amazon to an extremely small village, he was stung by a scorpion while hunting. He said, I was stuck in a hammock for three days. Once the effect of the scorpion sting took over, the fear became unbearable. The uncertainty of what might happen physically and how I would survive filled me. I was useless as a provider, but the extreme amount of compassion for me was overwhelming. All I could do was lay in my hammock, but a Hawaiiana shaman rarely left my side. He sat on a stool chanting for hours and hours on end, and he was given food. He was only there a very short time, but he said leaving that village was more emotional than all of the places that he stayed for a longer period of time because he had built this intimacy by showing his vulnerability, by being so vulnerable and by having the shaman take care of him. He said all he could do was thank the shaman who took care of him and show him how much he appreciated the compassion that he showed. What if every time fear took over, we knew we belonged to a community of people who were with us? What if we picture the people we love standing behind us? Oprah says that whenever she goes on stage, she brings all her ancestors with her. I bring everyone who has ever been kind with me, Maya Angelou says. 
If you don't have a community, how about you build one? Friends, family, children, spouse, partner, teacher, mentors, minister. What if you pictured all these people around you every time you felt fear? Could you draw strength from this? Picture the people you want to support you. Lock in their image behind you. Allow the positive feelings to help you next time you feel fear. Relationships heal fear. All fear is self-centered, and this emotion has little control over you when you are part of a supporting team. If you are dealing with job loss, location change, illness, loss of relationship, financial stress, lock into the image of your support system. Relationships heal fear. All right, so we're going to go into scripture. We're going to talk about helping others and being a friend. Philippians 2.4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. John 15.12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Proverbs 3.27, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can you keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Colossians 3.12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the bigger community global picture. So this is written by Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, I've used quite a bit in my talks. Um, he is an international religious scholar, a philosopher, an author. He wrote over 40 books. He was knighted by the queen in 2005. That's why he has Lord in his name. Um, he was the chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregation of the Commonwealth. Uh, he is not with us anymore. He passed in November of 2020. Um, but his work lives on and um, he's a brilliant scholar. He says, these are the times that try man's souls. That's the words of Thomas Paine. He said, we are in a fateful moment in the history of the West. We have had divisive elections, divided societies, the growth of extremism in politics and religion. This is fueled by anxiety and fear. The world is changing faster than we can bear. Is there something we can do to face the future without fear? One way to understand what's happening is to ask the question, what do people worship? They used to worship the sun and the stars and the storms. Some worshiped many gods, some none. Future anthropologists will take a look at the books we read on self-help, self-realization, self-esteem. They will look at how we talk about the morality as being true to oneself. They talk about politics as a matter of individual rights. They will look at this wonderful new religious ritual we have created, the one that is called the selfie. And they will conclude that what we worship is the self, the me, the I. This is great and empowering, but don't forget, biologically, we're all social animals. We spent most of our evolutionary history in small groups. We need face-to-face -face interactions where we create spiritual goods friendship, trust, loyalty, and love that redeem our solitude. When we have too much of the I and too little of the we, we can find ourselves vulnerable, fearful, and alone. Sherry Turkle wrote a book from, she's from MIT, and the book was called Alone Together, Why We Expect More from Technology and Less from Each Other. The simplest way of safeguarding the future is by strengthening the future us. There are three dimensions of the us, the us of relationship, the us of identity, and the us of responsibility. So he said a very long time ago, he was 20 years old, he was studying philosophy, he was into Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, Sartre, and Camus, he was full of existential angst. It was terrific, he said, I was self-obsessed and very unpleasant to be around. And one day I saw across the courtyard a girl who was everything that I wasn't. 
She radiated sunshine and she emanated joy. Her name was Elaine. We met, we talked, we married. 47 years later, three children and eight grandchildren later, you can say it was the best decision I ever made. It's the people not like us that make us grow. The trouble with Google filters, Facebook friends, learning from narrow casting versus broadcasting is that we are surrounded with people like us, views, opinions, prejudices, just like ours. There's a Harvard study that shows that if we surround ourselves more with people like us, we get more extreme. I think we need to renew those face-to-face -face encounters with people not like us. Understand we can disagree strongly and still stay friends. Understand they are just people like us. Every time we hold on our hand to someone not like us, we heal one of the fractures of our wounded world. That is the us of relationships. The us of identity, he talks about when you go to the US and you look at memorials, for instance, the Lincoln Memorial, the Gettysburg Address is on one side and on the sec other side is the second inaugural address. If you go to the Jefferson Memorial, there are screens of text. If you go to the Martin Luther King Memorial, there are more than a dozen quotes from his speeches. He says, in America, evidently you read memorials. He says, in the UK, it's not like that at all. There's a statue for David Lloyd George, and he has three words, David Lloyd George. There's one for Nelson Mandela who gets two words, and there's one for Churchill who gets one word. So America was from the outset a nation of a wave of immigrants. They had to create an identity which they did by telling the story that you learned at school, that you read on memorial, memorials, that you hear repeated all the time. The UK is not a nation of immigrants, so they could take their identity for granted. Two things happened which shouldn't have happened together. The first in the West was that we stopped telling the story of who and why we are, even in America. At the same time, immigration is higher than ever before. When we tell the story and our identity is strong, we can welcome the stranger. But when we stop telling the story and our identity gets weak, you feel threatened by the stranger. Jews, he said, have been scattered and dispersed and exiled for 2000 years, but they never lost their identity because at least once a year, they have the festival of Passover where they told the story, they taught it to their children, they ate the unleveled bread of affliction, they tasted the bitter herbs, they never lost their identity. We think collectively we've got to get back to telling our story, who we are, where we came from, what ideals by which we live. We come strong enough to welcome the stranger and say, come share our lives, share our stories, our aspirations, and our dreams. That's the us of identity. The us of responsibility. He said, my favorite phrase is we the people. It says we all share the collective responsibility for our collective future. We have extreme far right, far left, religious extremes, anti-religious extremes. The far right is dreaming of a golden age that never was. The far left is dreaming of a utopia that never will be. The religious and the anti-religious are equally convinced that all it takes is God or the absence of God to save us from ourselves. That is magical thinking. Because the only people who will save us from ourselves is we, the people, all of us together. When we do that, move from the politics of me to the politics of all of us together, we discover beautiful counterintuitive counter truths that a nation is strong when it cares for the weak. It becomes rich when it cares for the poor. It becomes invulnerable when it cares about the vulnerable. That is what makes great nations. Here's my suggestion. Do a search and replace operation on the text of your mind. Whenever you encounter the word self, substitute the word other. Instead of self-help, other help. Instead of self-esteem, other esteem. If you do that, you will begin to feel the power of what is one of the most moving sentences in all of religious literature. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. We can face any future without fear, so long as we know that we will not face it alone. So here's what I know. <clears throat> fear is a horrible state to live in alone. We go spinning out of control with what worst case scenarios, 
come through our mind of what could possibly go wrong. We are unable to see the truth clearly and unable to make appropriate decisions when we are living out of fear. We need the input from a trusted friend to balance out all the fear, the hysteria in our minds. When we are consumed with fear, we can't think clearly and we lose perspective. It takes love and compassion to settle us back down. Sometimes all we need is an ear. As we rant and rave and spew it all out, we hear our own words and the misalignment with the truth becomes obvious. I love the story of the Wayana and how no one has to be afraid of starving because someone of all of the hunters will be successful and they will take care of each other. Literally life and death hangs on depending on each other. And I love the end of the story. Eric Severson reminds us of what we fear most. He holds up a mirror and he says, what we fear most is looking in the mirror in the times of anxiety and seeing ourselves alone. And as Oprah and Maya Angelou teach, bring all your support system with you. As you're waiting in the waiting room of the doctor's office, carry that strength of love with you. So as you know, <laughs> I've had a horrible medical seven, five months. The last seven months, I literally have been to either a doctor or a exam or a bloodletting or a, um, a CAT scan or sonogram, some medical procedure at least once a week for the last seven months. Tests, blood work, exam, doctors, lung function tests, CAT scans, ultrasounds, ENT, all of the possible diagnosis that were then ruled out and then not ruled in and then they didn't work and then they weren't right, all of that for the last seven months. And then finally answers and finally the, finally the healing that has come with the right meds. I could not have done this without my friends and family. Weekly check-ins for an hour, hour and a half with my very, very best friend that you hear me talk about from New Jersey. Text messages, shorter weekly talks from people that are local here the overwhelmingly obvious conclusion that no matter what happened, I wasn't alone. Getting me back on track when I was spinning, being compassionate and reminding me, you've been through a lot, give yourself a break. And the constant reminder, I'm here for you, we'll go through this together. Recently, friends reached out and they said, I really wanna help, but I don't know what to do. What can I do? And so I said, I'd like a meal. I'm a horrible, horrible, horrible cook. <laughs> and I eat frozen food all the time. Well, so the reality is they said, yeah, great. So I went over to the house and, and I met some new people and I had this incredible meal and it, it, it felt like love was literally being poured over me like syrup. It was the most amazing thing in the world, just this one meal. I was there for, I don't know, two, two and a half hours. The food was absolutely wonderful, but it wasn't about the food. It was about feeling like I was wrapped in this blanket of protection and love and joy and nourishment and laughter and joy. I, I can't even tell you how wonderful experience it was. And it was because the person said to me, I don't know how to help you. What do you want? And I had to say, what can you do? What, what, what do I want? And when I was able to say, this is what I need, they immediately said, yeah, you got it. So it teaches us a lesson about we have to know what we want and we have to ask what we want and we have to be able to receive what we want. It's incredibly important. I'm doing very well now. I'm done with the tests and the exams and the poking and the prodding. It's done and I've come out the other side of it and I am so grateful. On a much larger scale, Rabbi Sachs reminds us that we can heal together that we can help each other and step out of our comfort zone to work on the divisiveness one person at a time that we as a whole will be better when we heal our community, again, one person at a time. I know my friends and family kept me sane and loved me. Maybe we can use that same love to reach out to someone who is different from us, socially, culturally, or of a different religion. Together we can heal. We can overcome past prejudices. We can show love and compassion to not only our friends and family, but a new neighbor of a different race who just moved in. We can heal, we can get better, we can be our best and highest selves if we face fear together. And so it is. Remember at all times, the power's in you. It always has been, and it always will be.